stage for us and convene us in our history um, as you succeed. She studied at the British Institute in Florence and at the University of Parma in Italy. And two years ago, she moved to England. I'm sure you're all very much looking forward to um, her course. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just do a voice test. Is that all right at the back? No. Okay. How does the volume work on here? The volume. The volume. That's this one here. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Could you turn the lights off? I prefer for you to just look at the screen rather than look at me because that's where um, the treasures of today's lecture are. So, Manchester Art Treasures, 1857, and an unlikely theology student. I wanted to place these, the title of the, um, the course started with the name of Edward Byrne Jones, and we are going to lead into him, but we're going to lead into him via the backdrop of the art world of the 1850s, because I think it's very significant, and it's always interesting to place an artist or, or to, to try to find out what world were these artists living in and if does that have an impact on the type of art that they are producing. So we're going to start with actually going forward 20 years to 1877. And in London, a grand event took place on the 1st of May and it was the opening of the Grosvenor Gallery. And this is what somebody, W. Graham Robertson, desc how, uh, described the opening night. I can well remember the wonder and delight of my first visit. One wall was iridescent with the plumage of Burne Jones' angels. One mysteriously blue with Whistler's nocturnes. One deeply glowing with the great figures of Watts. One softly radiant with the faint flower-tinted harmonies of Albert Moore. So in 1877, these four paintings featured in an elite gallery open only to the invited and the, the good, the great and the good of London society. But that wasn't really the norm for galleries at the time because previously, in 1857, another very important gallery opened or exhibition space opened. And when I know, and in, in my research, I've come to realize how significant and how innovative this exhibition was. I'm always amazed at how little there is about it. But maybe the reason is, is because this exhibition did not take place in London. Because even in the Victorian era, the whole of England was very London-centric, as it still is today. But it took place in Manchester. Now, Manchester in the 1850s was not known for its collections of beautiful art. It was not known for its talented artists. It was known, as these quotes describe to us, for thick black smoke covering the city, semi-daylight with 3,000 people working ceaselessly. It was the backdrop of capitalism, of Cottonopolis, they called Manchester, because the factories that made cotton in vast quantities were all based in this area. You can see from this painting here, you still have this lovely green area, but look what's in the distance, the smoke. And this line here, work, profit, and greed, seem to be the only thoughts here. The clatter of the cotton mills and the looms can be heard everywhere. This is important because Manchester was associated with industry and manufacturing, but more than anything, it was associated with making money. It was not associated with any cultural activity whatsoever. Except, of course, you always have people in any given society who will want to change things. They'll want to interrupt the status quo and perhaps add a different dimension to what was happening. And in 1857, the concept of what came to be known as the Manchester Art Treasures Exhibition was born. And it was an extraordinary social and cultural event. It was open for only five months, and in that time, 1.3 million people visited. Now, that would have been 
record-breaking for London, but it was even more record-breaking for Manchester. People came from all over the world to see it because the art world was fairly small, very elite at the time, and people spoke. And Charles Dickens told people to come. Charlotte Gaskill told people to come. It was patronized by Queen Victoria and her consort, Prince Albert. So this gave it a level of sophistication and something not to be missed. A palace was built. It was known as the Palace of Art. And it was built of glass and steel, very much like if you're familiar with the 1851 um, World Exhibition, a World Trade Fair in um, Crystal Palace, which was the sort of brainchild of Prince Albert. So he was very fond of being involved in um, art endeavors, which had some sort of social responsibility towards it. A site was chosen um, far, interestingly enough, from the centre of Manchester where all the, the factories and mills were because they wanted people to come to, Manchester, to Manchester purely to visit the exhibition and to be um, regaled with the wonders of the exhibition and not to have any connection to the industry. So they situated it in the site of Old Trafford where, of course, everybody knows is the home now to Manchester um, Manchester United football ground. But in all of these endeavours, you need somebody who's going to make it happen. Maybe people, other people had thought it was a good idea, but you need somebody as a catalyst to actually put in place the thing and make it happen. And that person was Thomas Fairbairn. He was um, an industrialist. He was incredibly wealthy. He was a patron, a patron of... Um, contemporary artists at the time, and he had a vision to bring to Manchester culture on a level that, not, that had never been seen before. And interestingly enough, it's never been seen again either, not only in Manchester, but in the whole of Britain. Every gallery has a blockbuster exhibition. They're the sort of, um, they're the money makers, if you like, of, of the galleries, because as, you'll, as you may know, it's free to go and visit uh, galleries in England, but a blockbuster exhibition will have a fee attached to it. And that is how the galleries make their money and they keep going. But there has been nothing, even the treasures of Tutankhamen, even the Leonardo da Vinci exhibition, nothing on the scale of the Manchester Art Treasures exhibition. So what Thomas Fairbairn wanted to achieve was the quote at the top, if the lads of the loom are exposed to the most beautiful and precious works of art in the land, then they might be inspired to stroll home strong in a determination to achieve something. Well, this is a lovely utopian ideal. This is wonderful to think that people are exposed to beautiful things and fine art, and they're going to walk away feeling cheerful and uplifted and what? Walk back into their noisy factory and start spinning cotton all over again. The reality of people's lives is obviously very different for the ideal that Thomas Fairbairn had in mind. But nevertheless, this didn't stop him from wanting to proceed. He wanted to promote the idea of educating the masses. It was something he felt passionate about. He also wanted to promote um, British wealth, but through its art. I'll speak about more of that in a minute. And he wanted to promote the benefits of royal patronage, what that would do to Manchester if Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were to, um, to become patrons of this grand exhibition. And he wanted to uplift the cultural status of Manchester. He wanted Manchester be, to be viewed along with the, um, the cultured elite of London to view Manchester in a similar way. We'll come to this um, chap here in a minute. So... What happens next then? A letter is dispatched to the Queen and asking for ad advice and help. Prince Albert immediately agrees to help. And they support the idea of this means of art as a social improvement. They love that idea. But what they also do is when they are requested to loan a few of their treasures, remember what the royal art um, household is, is an extraordinary collection, um, they offered 96 objects, paintings, um, watercolours, oil paintings, objects to be part of the exhibition. Because not only was this going to showcase fine art, it was also going to showcase 
um, the newly discovered um, art medium of photography, for example, fine sculptures, fine ceramics, tapestries, any manner of decorative object. In all, there were um, 16,000 objects were donated from the grand houses of England. Interestingly enough, even despite the royal patronage, um, and the, the, the Queen Victoria really sort of set the, the bar high when she offered so many of her personal items. Um, it was famously discovered that uh, the Duke of Devonshire refused to send any of his vast art collection, um, sort of muttering at the same time, um, what do they want with fine art in Manchester? Surely they must focus just on making money. So he had that sort of sense of what was the point which indeed was what a lot of people thought as well. So it was very important to get the, um, the patronage of the royal family. Prince Albert was there at the opening. That was a huge coup for them. And Queen Victoria came during the five months she visited, but at the time of the opening, she was on her last confinement of nine children actually giving birth to Princess Beatrice. So this is what it looked like inside, vast, glass and steel spaces, enormous. Somebody commented that it looked like being inside a turbine. It must have been an intimidating place, even for the um, art elite, shall we say. Described as a grand and whopping building, but it was light and elegant and effective. So much natural light was marvelous because um, it showcased everything to its best ability. It took six months to construct now, I would challenge a lot of buildings in the modern era of this stature to be constructed in six months at a cost of only £25,000. The entire budget for this exhibition was only £74,000, and that was raised by donations from the, from the families uh, or from the, the sort of aristocracy of England. It was 15,000 square yards in space, so it was vast. It would take you hours to walk around and to look at everything. If you think you are looking at 16,000 objects, the average exhibition space, for example, the Burne Jones exhibition that's on at the moment, is only 150 paintings or 150 things to look at. This had 16,000. There were, down the central aisle, you had sculptures, we had um, ceramics at the back. You can see the sort of the fine art portraits. I trust that the throngs who will crowd these halls will retire from them with their thoughts elevated, their ideas refined, and with a more tolerant disposition in judging of the works and motives of their fellow creatures. Again, this is Thomas Fairbairn wanting to create this type of environment. But did it work? Was it successful? Let's have a look. People commented, this is the, the vast space here, these helpless children and factory people had to find a shilling to pay for a catalogue or wander aimlessly amid the suits of armour, marble news and acres of canvas. So, of course, it was immediately realised on opening that even to the cultured and, and the educated, this was a daunting visit, let alone to people who A, couldn't afford the catalogue, but B, the catalogue had no pictures. The catalogue was just the, the entry of the artist and the date and perhaps the medium used. So that would mean very little to, to a lot of people visiting because what is so interesting about this, and one of the desires behind the organisers, was to bring in as many people from all social classes as possible. Special trains were put on to, to transport people in. And there were, for example, the first souvenirs. We all go now to the gift shop on your way out of an exhibition. You're usually forced through the gift shop as some sort of um, museum strategy. And you might buy a postcard, you might buy a fridge magnet. These were the things that were started with the Manchester Art Treasures exhibition because this was a big public display of art. This was something that the, everybody could come to. There were special days where the price was reduced so that more people could visit. The commemorative medal at the top here, this is the, um, the cover of a, of a brochure, but 
interestingly, the brochure they had, um, or the catalogue, was in dialect. One was in normal English and one was in a northern dialect, which would have made it easier for people to read. But then a lot of people couldn't read and they didn't have the shilling to buy the catalogue. So there were lots of problems, uh, logistical problems, with um, creating this type of um, super mega exhibition, if you like. One new thing that the Manchester Art Treasures brought to gallery viewing, which of course we now expect um, whenever we go to visit somewhere, is the idea of refreshments. It's to encourage you to stay longer, it's to encourage you to spend more, obviously, but it is also to encourage you to engage in a more comfortable way. And what is also very interesting is some factory owners who were on the same wavelength, if you like, ideologically with Thomas Fairbairn, actually paid for special trains and the very first package trips um, organized by Thomas Cook. Those of you from England or further will know about Thomas Cook, the travel agent. The very first package trips were to the Manchester Art Treasure Exhibition. It was your train ticket, your exhibition ticket, and your refreshment ticket, all included in one price. And there were special purpose-built rooms, of course, different classes of room. You'd have your upper-class dining hall, and then your sort of lower-grade um, refreshment <laughs> areas. And Titus Salt brought 2,600 of his factory workers one Sunday to visit the exhibition paid for by himself because he too held the same belief as Thomas Fairbairn. And um, on some days, 30,000 people went through the turnstiles of this exhibition just in one day. So we're talking about extraordinary numbers and really an extraordinary social event, but not just a social event, a civic event. This was very much the Manchester Art Treasures Exhibition. It was about putting Manchester onto the map, if you like, but the artistic and cultural map of the time. So just quickly looking at the innovations, the hanging, what, what, how, could they, how could the organizers create an environment that was um, pedagogic as well as pleasurable? It was going to be about learning and going to be about educating. Prince Albert wrote and sent advice about how to hang things in a specific way. Now, in the National Gallery at this time, there was no chronological hanging. So there was no way that you could sort of immerse yourself in a, in a sort of art history lesson going to visit the National Gallery. This was a way that had been adopted in Paris and in Berlin at their National Galleries, but London was a bit slow on the uptake. But this is what they tried to organise at the Manchester Art Treasures, that all of these 16,000 random items were not just thrown higgledy-piggledy onto the walls and into the, um, into the corridors. They were considered and thought about. They decided, this is George Scharf, who was the other portrait that we looked at earlier. This is a, a little drawing, I mean, a, a, a fine artwork in itself, really, of where to hang things that would give some sort of um, historical background to, to the theme. For example, these two paintings here, you've got the Nativity, the Adoration of the Kings, it's Botticelli and Gossert. They're from different countries, but they're produced within a 10-year period of each other. So you could learn what was happening in different countries around the same time by looking at these things. Obviously, this type of level of um, organization was aimed at a much higher intellectual person coming to visit the gallery. But nevertheless, a lot of thought went into um, these types of creative hangings. What the loans did reveal was the extent of the British art treasures in private houses and in, in, um, that people never really got to see. And of course, that had a knock-on marvelous effect for the art world, the commercial art world, because against the backdrop of the popularity of the Manchester Art Treasures exhibition, many of these paintings were sold because there were people from all over the world, especially from America, who came and saw these marvelous pictures. And sadly for Britain, many of them did leave the country shortly afterwards, like this one here, for example. Um, St. Francis in the Desert, which is now in the Frick Collection in New York. But it was a way of people realizing the marvelous collections of art that there were available in England. 
This, Man this is known forever now as the Manchester Madonna, and it hangs in the Manchester City Art Gallery. It had recently been assigned to Michelangelo. This is one of the top sort of draw cards, if you like, for the elite. They were able to say, well, we have, we've got a Michelangelo to show you. And of course, this charming um, Simone Martini, it's one of the very, very few examples of um, Jesus being told off by his parents, if you like. They are questioning him and saying, well, where have you been? Because they, he's obviously, at the time, his response was, um, I've been at my father's business, about my father's business when he was in the temple. But I love this because you've got Mary sort of imploring him, as any mother of a teenager would when they're concerned for the whereabouts of their child. And he's standing there in this lovely sort of petulant arms crossed as if to say, you can imagine a speech bubble of the modern world would say, whatever, or you know, some rather disdainful reply. And it, it's a really human element to the um, sacred story. And all of these three paintings were seen in public for the first time in these um, Manchester Art Treasures exhibition. I just wanted to show you this. This is quite an extraordinary painting and reveals the, the detail and the skill at Giovanni Bellini, not only to, to create a, uh, an atmospheric and moving sacred picture, but when you look at the detail, this is here. Look at the expression on the little rabbit's face. There's just something so appealing about that. And you don't get to see, unless you're really close up with these paintings, you don't get to see as much detail um, as that normally. It's just been restored, so it's looking at its absolute best at the moment. Another really important part of this was that it offered a showcase, an informal showcase, if you like, for contemporary artists' work. And contemporary at the time were the pre-Raphaelites, the very controversial pre-Raphaelites, the first generation, which was um, Holman Hunt, John Millet, and Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And they were all invited to exhibit. Remember, this is an exhibition, not a sale. So you're not putting your pictures up to be sold. You're just putting your pictures up to be shown. So that, for contemporary artists, was a completely novel idea. And Holman Hunt sent this one, The Hiling Shepherd. Millet sent The Autumn Leaves. But interestingly enough, and we're going to come to this later, but it's quite important for our story, is where was Rossetti? Why didn't he submit? We'll come to that a little bit later, but keep that thought. Some things, of course, in the gallery were more popular than others. And the most astonishing painting that was commented on by almost everybody, but especially the um, working class visitors, was this painting by the death of Chatterton, um, called The Death of Chatterton by Henry Wallace. And such was the, was the realness, the tactile um, detail, is that people tried to step forward to touch the painting, to sort of straighten out the bedclothes. This had been exhibited at the Royal Academy the year before, also to great acclaim. And for the very first time, a, a little um, rope had had to be secured in front of the painting to actually stop people leaning forward and touching it. And this was, if you had to choose one picture of the exhibition, apparently this was the top picture. Another thing that it showcased for the first time was this uh, very new and emerging art form, which was photography. Previously, in the sort of 1830s and 40s, photography mostly was used to record information. It was used by um, geologists, archaeologists. It was used as a more of a scientific form of recording information. It was only in the early 50s, 1850s, that people began to use um, photography posed situations as an art form. And these photographs were hung in the exhibition as alongside um, fine art, old masters, watercolors, as a new art form in itself. And you can see um, an example of that here. So that was another um, innovation of the time. But of course, there were going to be some negative responses because to every um, philanthropist of the time, there will be always somebody cynical alongside to say, you're wasting your time. Like the Duke of Devonshire, I'm not giving my pictures. And they came not in um, short numbers of criticism, I might say. The Times was commenting, um, it was like feeding strong meat to children. What was the point? They didn't see the ideological point. 
Charles Dickens commented that it was too still, that it needed something twisting, even something as simple as a fountain. So because Charles Dickens visited in the very few opening weeks, the organizers installed fountains so that the movement of the water on these sort of triple-tiered fountains would give the people more comfort because they were used to a moving environment working in factories. It was noted as well by Charles Dickens that it was too quiet because they're used to a noisy environment. So on certain days, an orchestra, um, the Charles Haller Orchestra, which then went on to be the still world-famous Haller Orchestra of today, they started playing on certain days just to break that silence. I'm sure you will all agree that sometimes when you go into a gallery or an exhibition, you feel that sort of sense of awe and you want to speak in hushed tones, and that can be really intimidating. You don't want to have squeaky shoes or talk too loudly when you're walking around. And they wanted to create an environment where people would relax and feel comfortable, and they believed that in that way they would engage on a much deeper level with the things that they were looking at. Um, but of course, John Ruskin, the famous um, art critic of the time, he had the worst things to say, because he really, in this quote, sort of describes how you can't construct um, an artist. You have to... Um, you have to find them. And an analogy for this would be, for me, something like, um, I don't know if you know, a program called The X Factor, which is now people sort of manufactured by a panel of judges into making a sound that at the end of the series will sell lots of records and make lots of money for the organisers. It's not necessarily that these people have it in their soul to be musicians they are manufactured and i think this is what ruskin was trying to say here that you can't force people to look at art and become um, sensitive to it they have to have it within them already but i would counter argue that and say if you've never been exposed to it you don't know that you have that sensibility inside you to respond to something in a given way so it's always better to show and expose people to art and to culture rather than to deny them that uh, possibility but M john ruskin does come round in the end the exhibition closed after 142 days having made a profit of only 304 pounds the idea was that the profits from the exhibition would be enough to open a permanent Manchester City art gallery. That didn't happen. But luckily, the ideas that were established with the exhibition were taken forward, and within a few years, and certainly by the end of the century, in every provincial town in Britain, a gallery or an, a museum space opened up. So you now have marvelous collections in cities like Manchester, Liverpool, obviously Cambridge and Oxford, but Bradford, Leeds, um, and moving into Scotland, Glasgow, Edinburgh. These have marvelous collections in them, usually of, of a whole array of subjects and objects, as was the Manchester Art Treasures exhibition. And it's really a legacy that has been left to the country that started with this idea of the Manchester Art Treasures. Um, of course, it created a huge buzz in the art world, partly because it happened in Manchester and not London, and Londoners were very jealous that it had happened in Manchester, and it created a bit of rivalry, which is it's actually still very much in place today. But the final sort of ending of it, which was actually what was written um, I think that the idea of it is the quote from Keats, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. This is the closing words of Thomas Fairbairn on the last day. And he had actually had that written. As you can see here, there are words around the, the exit here. These are those words, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. And it comes from John Keats' poem, The Endym Endymion. And really it's talking about the, the thing of joy. So if you're looking at a beautiful object, that beautiful object might not last, but the memory of your response to that stays with you forever. So the joy of that stays with you forever. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. And it was really this marvelously ideological idea of making art available to the masses, which, which was so innovative about um, the Manchester art treasures. 
So that's the backdrop of where we are in the 1850s, in the sort of the, the commentary that's happening. And I said to you, where was Rossetti? Well, let's see where he was. Because there were two reasons why he didn't um, exhibit at the Manchester Art Treasures exhibition. His very early pictures received such negative response. And being a sort of hot-blooded, passionate Italian, he was so offended and took to heart the negative criticism that he, in a fit of um, petulant rage, said, I'm never going to exhibit again in public, not, of course, realizing how that would handicap him for his artistic career. And he never did. So he refused to send anything to Manchester on principle. But also, he was also rather busy that summer. And he was busy in Oxford. He had a new apprentice by the name of Edward Byrne-Jones. And a new building had been constructed in a sort of grand Tudor Gothic style by the architect Woodward. And Rossetti and a whole group of his friends and companions were asked to decorate the interior. This is now the, um, the old library. I think it was the debating hall at the time. It was built to be the Student Union Debating Hall. As you can see now, it's the old library. It is, I, sadly, I've never been. It's very difficult to get access, but I believe it's very um, pale in color, very difficult to see because you have these windows which offer too much light. This, this summer, the long vac was passed um, in Oxford with really Rossetti at the helm and his two new friends, William Morris and Edward Byrne Jones, who were in Oxford. They had been in Oxford for a number of years at Exeter College, both of them studying to become priests. And by the summer of 1857, under the sort of uh, welcoming arms of the passionate Dante Gabriel Rossetti, they decide that a clerical life is not for them, and they're actually going to follow their passion, and they're going to both become... William Morris declared he was going to be an artist, and Edward Byrne Jones declared he was going to be a painter. So they spend the summer painting these panels. They, are, they love the Arthurian stories, the, the Mort d'Arthur by Thomas Mallory, and the um, Idols of the King by Alfred Lord Tennyson. The stories of Arthur appeal to them, these quests, um, looking after uh, damsels in distress. The, the love triangle between Guinevere and Lancelot and Arthur appeal to them. And so they set about painting the murals. William Morris, who never feels himself to be a very talented painter, but more of a designer, he uh, does the ceiling, and the murals are done by this various group, Rossetti, Morris, Princep, and Edward Byrne-Jones. And this is where they start, if you like, to form, or, or certainly Byrne-Jones and Rossetti form, not a partnership, but a master-apprentice relationship. Rossetti is flattered, of course, by the attention of his younger pupil, and Byrne Jones is like a sponge and absorbs everything that Rossetti has to give him. And he says this, later in life, he says that Rossetti taught me to have no fear or shame of my own ideas. If you know anything about the art of Rossetti, you'll know that he was a very unique, independent artist who, from a group of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, really went off on a personal tangent of his own to design perpetually, keep drawing, keep going, to seek no popularity. Remember, Rossetti never exhibited in public. He didn't need the public acclaim, of course, but he did need the money. Um, but to be altogether myself. Now, that's really important, because going through, we'll be looking at Edward Byrne Jones, who forges his own line through this uh, moment in history of art. There's nobody like him. People, there are other artists that don't, that work alongside him. There are artists that try to emulate him, but there's nobody that quite has the same depth of vision, imaginative, creative vision that Byrne Jones has, not just in painting, but also in other mediums that we know him to be so successful in, which was stained glass and tapestries. He was more, he was a designer artist or an artist designer. The two things are completely inseparable from each other. And it was really that time with Rossetti that he um, was influenced so much by this. This, of course, is the famous panel by Rossetti. It's the most um, well-preserved one. And it, of course, depicts Lancelot and Guinevere. Lancelot is slumped over here. On his shield is interesting, is a snake, symbol of temptation. And this is the Holy Grail here. 
but he's denied access into the chapel of the Holy Grail because of his sin, the sin, of course, being the adulterous relationship that we ha he had with Guinevere while she was married to King Arthur. And I'm pointing this all out to you because these love triangles are something which will follow, um, uh, well, follow Rossetti, but also significantly follow Edward Burne Jones through much of his life. And um, this sort of medieval figure here is um, the, the model for this was a woman called Jane Burden. She was discovered during this um, time which was known as the Jovial Campaign. Um, interestingly, they weren't paid for this work, but they were offered unlimited amounts of soda water. Whether they mixed the soda water with something else, I'm not sure. Um, and it is quite well known, apparently, that they were only given soda water, but it's also very well known for this sort of um, light-hearted, fun, uh, long vac that they all passed. And they met what they, um, Rossetti used to refer to a beautiful woman as a stunner. And Jane Burden was probably the ultimate stunner of all the Pre-Raphaelites. Remember, this is 1857, 1858. So he's already met the famous Elizabeth Siddle with the long, flowing red hair. But he moves now. His uh, object of affection is the dark, raven-haired um, Jane Burden, who very shortly becomes, a year later, Jane Morris, because she marries one of Rossetti's um, new interests, which was William Morris. And this is the only painting that Morris ever attempts, which is her as um, the Belle Isolt, is Tristram and Isolt, but it equally could be Guinevere. And on the back of the painting, he says, I love you, but I cannot paint you. And he does end up marrying. And of course, there's a whole other story about what happens with their relationship. But these trysts, if you like, these triangular trysts are quite important for Burne Jones as well. So this is the atmosphere of the summer. And Burne Jones absorbs, this is just a, a drawing of uh, Jane Burden at the time by uh, Morris, um, sorry, by Rossetti, very similar to how she is depicted here. Burne Jones spent all of that time absorbing everything he could from uh, Rossetti. Rossetti not only at this time was uh, drawing, changing his uh, modus operandi, if you like, from watercolors into half portrait size oils, but he had this passion for the medieval. He had a passion for Dante, Chaucer, um, the 13th century Italian poets. And it was not only their artistic interests that they shared, but very much their literary interests. All of the Pre-Raphaelites were literary painters. And I think very often people walk away from Pre-Raphaelite art feeling underwhelmed, because if you're not familiar with the stories of the paintings that they depict, they can leave you feeling a little cold, because there they are, um, beautiful ladies, beautiful colors, lots of symbols, lots of details. But if you don't know what the, all of those mean, you can just feel a little um, underwhelmed. So. Rossetti, as he said in the beginning quote, it encouraged Burne Jones to design perpetually. You can take that as meaning draw perpetually, draw all the time. It is something that great artists from the time of Leonardo were doing, drawing, drawing, drawing. And these types of drawings that uh, Burne Jones was producing were almost on the, they now are artworks in themselves, but they are just pen and ink, but they're incredibly fine, detailed works, as you can see from this one here. This is the Wise and Foolish Virgins. But already, in this type of drawing design, we see the similarity to what he will later go on to produce, which is a tapestry form. The picture is Everything is very dense and squashed in and packed in. If you, you have to really look into it to see actually what's going on. Yes, there are five heads here, and there are five here. But you have to count them, one, two, three, four, and one at the back to see, because they're crammed into this almost sort of suffocating, dense space. There is a peacock here. You can just see the outline of it, the head here and the, the tail here. So you really have to look in and see uh, the detail that he's trying to produce. But as with Rossetti, this watercolor and then the drawing of the same time, they almost have quite a darkness about them, this cross-hatching cross -hatching 
technique and then smudging into the corners. Rossetti was said to have described them as marvels of finish and imaginative details, unequaled by anything unless perhaps Dürer's fine works. Well, I don't know if you're familiar with Dürer, but this is perhaps one of his most famous drawings, um, Melancholy, where you get the sense of these, the same shadowing in the spaces here. You've got in the work of Burne Jones, very much a similarity. I'm not sure that Burne Jones would have known already the work of Dürer, but possibly, and certainly um, Rossetti did from books of engravings and illustrations. But you can see that similarity of detail just with this medium of pen and ink. It's extraordinarily fine work. So, Edward Burne Jones, born 1833 in Birmingham. Birmingham at the time, very similar to Manchester. It was a dirty, grimy, very poor city, but also, of course, you've got very, um, people making a lot of money out of um, manufacturing as well. Um, Birmingham was well known then and still is well known now for its jewellery quarter. Edward Burne Jones' mother was uh, Bessie Coley, and her family came from a line of jewellery makers. And they, were, they had a, a relative amount of money. The property, they, were, they lived in their own home, for example. But Edward's father was what I would like to describe as respectable poverty, because he did have a job. He was a framer, and he used to gilt made frames and then make frames for people. But he wasn't a great successful framer. He didn't have any grand commissions. But he did have a job, and thanks to his wife, they lived in their own home. So a sort of degree of respectful poverty. Sadly, six days after Edward was born, his mother died. And it was a devastating blow, obviously for the child, but unknown at the child at the time, but for the father who became a sort of withdrawn, a rather desolate character. But what his mother left in the property was a selection of books because she loved romantic poetry and she loved romantic novels of the early 19th century. So as Burne Jones grew up and began to be able to read, he was exposed to the literature that his mother loved and possibly some of the design qualities inherent in her jewellery making family background he might have acquired from her as well. But of course, we will never know that. As a young man, he attended King Edward VI School in Birmingham, which was a grammar school. He was bullied incessantly because he was very slim, very slight, um, rather awkward, known to be quite a comedian, but that didn't always get him out of bullying with the, the more robust boys. But as he, he um, of course, when you're marginalized from the society, you sometimes put your energies into another area. He read voraciously, and he was allowed access to the school library, which, of course, would be full of the classics and the great novels of the late 18th, early 19th century. And this is where his imaginative ideas began to form. He was taken under the wing of a schoolmaster who saw the potential for him, and he was encouraged to learn and to study. And eventually, he applied for Oxford. And he was successful, and he got in to study, as I said, theology at Exeter College. He married very early on. He, he met um, Georgi Georgiana MacDonald as a young boy, and when she was 15 and he was 20, they, he, invite, he asked her to marry him, and she agreed. They had a four-year um, engagement, but nevertheless, she was a person who featured in his life for most of his life, from his childhood right up until his death. And she's described by her sister as she was small with dainty little hands and feet, rosy complexion, abundant hair, brown with bronze lights in it, and glorious dark blue eyes. In that little frame dwelt a noble spirit. In this charming portrait of her, quite later on in life, the two children in the background, Philip and Margaret, I think the stillness of the portrait and the look is more about decorum in portraiture at the time rather than a, any sort of vacuous mind. She was a strong woman. She was a talented artist in her own right, but she gave that up in order for the advancement of her husband. Of course, that is what the time dictated, 
But nevertheless, it was, a, an, a, it was a, a grievance for her, which emerges later on um, in another part of the story. She supported him in all of his tempestuous, illicit extramarital affairs. She was the bedrock of the family and supported everything that was thrown at her. She was a very, a, a, an amazing woman and came indeed from an amazing family. Two of her sisters, her sister was mother to Rudyard Kipling, one of her sisters, and another one of her sisters was mother to Stanley Baldwin. So they were a significant family, very religious family. So we'll see, we'll keep these images in mind and move on to what was the early output, artistic output of um, Burn Jones. Interestingly enough, he and Rossetti both get married the same year, 1860. And interestingly enough, they both offer rather extraordinary wedding gifts to their partners. This is a piano which um, was painted by Burne Jones, and the theme is ladies and death. Here you've got this charming sort of women with musical instruments sort of lazing against a backdrop. And here you've got the figure of death with the scythe here, the great reaper of death. It's a rather odd choice of design for a wedding gift. Inspired by the, the lovely, um, he'd been to Pisa already, he'd seen the frescoes in the Campo Santo, so he knew of this um, formation here. And extraordinarily, Rossetti, remember they spent a lot of time with each other at this time, created this for Elizabeth Siddle. It's known as How They Met Themselves, and it's the doppelganger um, legend where when you come across the twin of yourself, you know that within a matter of moments, certain death will befall you. And you can see that when Elizabeth Siddle sees her twin, the spectra of her twin, which is this sort of line around here, denotes them as being from another world, she faints as the realization that she's about to die. So both of these things, and it just really speaks to me of the sensibility of the imagination of both Rossetti and Burne Jones, and how they were the perfect combination of master and um, master and pupil, if you like, in these early, very formative years um, for uh, Burn Jones's work. I just want to do quickly another couple of slides. Early watercolors that specifically follow the themes of love and grief and love and death, also very prominent in the work of Rossetti. Um, this is Clark Saunders, who uh, forced his uh, girlfriend to, to go to bed with him before they were married. She agreed. She was found by her brothers in a sort of, um, in a moment of, you know, incognito, and um, they kill him, but he comes back to haunt her. So, it's, you know, it's an unhappy moment. This, of course, is Nimue, who has stolen the Book of Spells from Merlin. Without his Book of Spells, he's going to wither away and die. In fact, he's clutching his heart. His faithful little symbol of the dog here is pulling at his robe. Come away, come away, don't be drawn in by her. She's a sorceress. And he's about to sort of fall into this gloom of hole and pass away. And, you know, these symbols of love and grief, love and death, they were very popular. And John Ruskin describes these paintings as nasty black and brown things. And yes, I mean, you can see it's nothing like the sort of spectra of color that we're going to see from Burne Jones' later work. Fair Rosamond was a great favorite of the Pre-Raphaelites because she was the, um, the lover of Henry II, and he kept her locked up in a convent, and he followed the, her the way in to find her with a ball of wool. You can see the ball of wool. This is Rosamond on this side. But this is Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, not a woman to be messed with who one day had had enough of the fair Rosamond, follows her in and says, right, two choices here. It's poison or the dagger. And when faced with such a choice, um, apparently she went for poison. But there's also other um, elements to the legend is that she might have been, the area that she might have lived in was Woodstock near Oxford and Godstow Abbey. The ruins of Godstow Abbey is supposed to be where she's buried. But, you know, that's all the stuff of legends, which is, of course, of the stuff that the Pre-Raphaelites loved. And here you've got, as I've put at the bottom here, this strange mixture of Gothic spirituality, graceful, classical poses, this lovely sort of drapery here. 
but shrouded in the respectability of an idea, certainly of the early Renaissance, the sort of work of uh, Benozzo Gozzoli and the frescoes of the Campo Santo is what we're looking at. But look at these things here and here. We're going to come back to that. But interestingly, this is 1861, Burne Jones. By this time, Rossetti, same theme, is really moved in a different departure now. This is his new muse, um, uh, Fanny Cornforth, and he's moving down, as I said, a very singular, very unique uh, frame. And Burne Jones, they don't separate by any means at all, but artistically, they're, they're after different things and they go down different roads. By 1862, we begin to see emerging a much more refined hand to um, Edward Byrne Jones. He's much more intent on fine detail, on fine color. He's by now working for Morris & Co, designing stained glass windows, and we can see that coming out in these artworks. Um, very, in, very lovely, very beautiful, the colors, the symbolism, of course, here for the Annunciation, this great wing at the back here. The squashed picture plane is very, and this, the slippers here, reminds me hugely of one of the most popular pictures in the National Gallery when it arrived in 1842, was the marriage of the Arnolfini. If you look at the bed here, very similar bed here, and the slippers, just incidentals of everyday life, trying to make these pictures more accessible to people, more understandable, more homely and humane, if you like. But then look at the mirror. I said to you, just go back there, the mirror. All of these things, artists like Burne Jones looked at other artists' work. That's where they drew their inspiration from. They had their own imagination, but they did study to a huge extent other artists. And I definitely think he would have spent time in the National Gallery looking particularly at this picture. And also the effect of mirrors, how that can distort um, a dimensional space. And then perhaps his most significant watercolor of the time is this one. It's called The Merciful Knight. There is an extraordinary tenderness between this knight who has decided to um, let his assailant live and then is thanked by Jesus for the kind gesture. This sort of bowing of the wooden figure gives it a sense of, um, of reality. But again, you've got this, this foreshortening in the background here, marigolds, which are a symbol of grief. Um, this very dense, you could see this translating here immediately into a tapestry, and it would work because that, that dense quality of detail is exactly how tapestries work. He was fascinated with this form, and we see it again in here, this wine of Circe. It's an awkward image. It looks awkward to us when we're used to more linear, more sort of idealized forms, but it works here. You've got these very, very strong, um, horizontal planes. Circe, of course, was the temptress who is waiting. These are the ships of Odysseus at the back here. She's putting this potion into the wine. You see the drops here? Sink the black drops into the vase of wine at the back here. She's going to seduce the men and turn them into pigs and keep them on her island. She's not a nice person, but interestingly, in this um, ekphastic uh, poem, and that means um, Rossetti apparently was so taken by the beauty of this picture and the imaginative quality of it that he immediately penned a sonnet to go with it. And he talks, you know, he describes her following the sort of Ruskinian truth to nature concept, dusk haired and gold robed. There she is, dusk haired and golden robed. But interestingly, she, he puts here Helios and Hecate. Helios, of course, is the sun god, the male sun god, represented here by the sunflowers. But Hecate is the goddess of magic. She's the goddess of witchcraft, and she's the goddess of the night. So she's a more sinister person. But interestingly, how even in Rossetti's poem, he's recognizing that this figure is an androgynous figure. It's neither specifically male nor specifically female. And that's very important. Very sinister, threatening painting. It comes with a, an air of discomfort. You can imagine at the, at the exhibition, exhibiting of this in 1862 at the Old Watercolor Society, they were fairly, um, fairly um, char not charmed, um, surprised by this sort of 
um, ambiguity, if you like, more than anything, because it's there's not there's no clarity here as to who's who, and it's a very dark, um, menacing image, if you like. The next one that were to cause huge caused a huge stir at the same gallery was this other one here, the lament, and it's again it was the androgynous figures that caused a stir. They couldn't identify them as either male or female. It's so interesting that Rossetti picked that up in assigning the qualities of the god and the goddess to the same figure of Circe. And here it was described as um, 